welcome everybody and um, I'm so thrilled that you all are here. As you could see, our presenta presentation tonight is on birding New Zealand. Um, my name is Linda Lee and I am one of the board members of Colorado Field Ornithologist. I'm thrilled that Eric DeFonso is going to be presenting on this and our host. We're very excited to have Taiki James as the host for the night. Welcome Taiki. <laughs> And um, we're just going to have a few um, announcements to uh, get things rolling. So um, first of all, Denver Field Ornithologist has been so generous in letting us CFO make announcements during their presentations that we are um, asked uh, DFO if they would like to do the same as well. So we have Sharon here from DFO who's gonna make a few announcements. And then I'll make a few announcements about CFO, and then we're going to dive right into the presentation. So Sharon, take it away. Thanks, Linda. I'm Sharon Tignano. I'm the president of the board of Denver Field Ornithologists. And we have a few programs coming up uh, in the near future here. First of all, tomorrow uh, is another Bird Bombs with David Sedgen. It's focused on winter waterfowl. And then we'll have another bird bombs on December 12th that gets you ready for Christmas bird counts. It's really exploring those tricky IDs that come up during Christmas bird counts. And our next program is Monday, November 25th. Uh, it's about the American Dipper, a magical mountain friend. And the presenter is Jessie Reese. She's an avian ecologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. All of these programs are via Zoom. They all start at 7 p.m. And you can register on the upcoming programs page at our website, which is dfobirds.org. So they're free, uh, open to everyone. So please join us. We'd love to, love to have you there. And the other thing that's happening with DFO right now is we have a special fundraising um, opportunity for Hawkwatch on Dinosaur Ridge which runs from March 1st through May 10th in 2025. And we have a donor who's matching all the grants, all the donations made to that fund, which is at coloradogives.org. So you just search for Dinosaur Ridge Hawk Watch there and you can be part of that effort. Uh, even a small donation will be matched, will be doubled. So, so please consider. And thanks a lot, Linda. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to make a few announcements and I'll stop sharing now. Bet. And yeah, CFO is a proud supporter as well of Dinosaur Hawk Watch. So pleased that uh, Sharon um, uh, brought up that, uh, that wonderful program. Um, and for CFO, so here's just a few announcements on our end. Um, we each year fund research grants and it's, um, as you can mm. see, it's a way to advance the appreciation and preservation of our state bird. We, um, this past year in 2024, I think we had about eight different research grants we funded. The deadline to apply for next year's research grants is December 1st. And you can find that on our website. In the chat, I'm going to put in a link for that as well. Um, so if you want to just bookmark it for later. Um, the Our 2025 CFO convention is going to be in Grand Junction this year. It's June 5th through 8th. Um, it's going to be, uh, we kind of are getting, you know, you know, still getting those migrating birds, but also hoping that the snow on uh, up on the Mesa will kind of dissipate a bit so that we could get to some of those trails up there. Mm. So we figured that June 5th through 8th will be a nice sweet spot. Um, and registration will be opening in late winter. And as uh, Sharon mentioned, yes, Colorado Gives Day is coming up on December 10th. If you could please keep Colorado Field Ornithologists in mind in your giving for Colorado Gives Day. So um, I will make, uh, I will put in once again in the chat links to the research grants um, information about the convention and our link to Colorado Gives Day. And I'm going to stop sharing now. And I am now going to be turning it over to our host, Taiki. Take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, really great announcements. Really great and a mouge bouge of birding news. I hope everybody can participate, support uh, the, the birders you love and the birds you love probably even more. Um, 
But with that, let's get ready for an adventure. On behalf of the Colorado Field Ornithologist, I am thrilled to introduce one of my neighbors, Eric DeFonzo, a passionate birder who's about to take us on a whirlwind tour of New Zealand's avian wonders. And if you want some of the taste of New Zealand, there's a nice little savory pie place in Lafayette. Um, highly recommend. <laughs> but for birds, we can talk about Eric's month-long expedition as it was truly inspirational, from waddling uh, uh, penguins to elusive kiwis and majestic albatrosses to uh, melodious endemic songbirds, he has some great inspiration to share with us this evening. And with over 30 decades, with over three decades as a birder, yeah. I can relate to that. Eric's presentation will surely enlighten birders of all levels. So without further ado, let's welcome the man who can spot a stitch bird faster than you can say lifer, Eric DeFonzo. Oh, thank you, Techie. That's very kind of you. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, make sure that works. Let me know if this is all working. Is everyone, can everyone see that now? Yep, looking great. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so yeah, again, thank you so much, Taiki. That a, was a thrilling introduction uh, to receive uh, on your part. And yes, I'm here to share my experience from last year, uh, late 2023, when I spent uh, 28 days uh in country in uh, New Zealand and I've got so many pictures I want to share I have so much uh in the way of experiences uh, uh that um I had to filter through and kind of decide you know what can I what do I have time to share what do I have to leave out and of course and you're going to see that I had a lot of trouble leaving anything out um and I hope uh, that you can endure the next 45, 50, 55 minutes. Uh, and I'll try to keep it very interesting for you. Uh, I, I selected uh, so many of what I think are, are my best photos. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, where I went, how I traveled uh, and why I went. Uh, I wanna cover a little bit about New Zealand natural history because part of what makes traveling to New Zealand so fascinating is understanding what is this place? How did it get to be the way it is? And, uh, you know, why do we know so little about it? And, uh, and you know, what role does it play in the scheme of, of human history uh, uh, in that backdrop of natural history as well? I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the conservation measures that uh, New Zealand uh, is pursuing uh, in defense of their amazing endemic wildlife. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the interesting name, in, naming issues that they have in New Zealand regarding the names of the birds, uh, how, chal how challenging that presents itself for travelers, especially from North Um. And of course, I'm going to show lots of pictures of the special birds of New Zealand, endemics and, uh, and rarities and specialties uh, like the kiwis, the penguins, and the albatrosses. And I'm going to certainly highlight a bit about the pelagic birding, which is something we here in Colorado do not ever get to experience uh, unless we leave the state. And New Zealand, as it as I found out, is perhaps the premier pelagic birding destination in the world. And uh, it's easy to see why. Whoops, sorry, whoops, uh, I think I need to do this. All right, so um, this is an overview of what my trip was last year, uh, November 16th to the December 14th. That was 28 full days, four full weeks. Um, I hit the North Island, the South Island, and Stewart Island, which is probably the largest of the offshore islands of New Zealand. I'll show plenty of maps so you get an idea of the place names that I'm talking about. Uh, my objectives of this trip was, I mean, it was a vacation, but uh, if you know me at all, I have trouble having relaxing vacations. I like to see everything. I want to bird every possible place that I can in the time permitted. Uh, so I, I wanted to study New Zealand avifauna. I wanted to take pictures and get sound recordings. I also wanted to uh, uh, fulfill my uh, Lord of the Rings nerd aspects and visit some of the uh, Lord of the Rings filming sites and tour uh, the Maori villages uh, when I had a chance. 
Uh, I did multiple pelagic birding trips, and I just wanted to appreciate life and my good fortune in being able to travel to such a fantastic location. I'd been thinking about traveling to New Zealand for three decades, and uh, it just, I thought maybe I'd never be able to go, but I made a concerted effort last year to do so, and I'm so glad that I did. Uh, this is a picture that I shared on my Facebook page uh, right before I left. I wanted to kind of depict on Google Earth the Great Circle Route going from uh, where I live in Lafayette all the way to the Auckland Airport, and it's uh, 7,329 miles. Uh, on that great circle route. And you can kind of see just how much of the globe you have to span just to go to this uh, far flung location that we call New Zealand. Uh, just to give you an idea of like where New Zealand is and how it relates to the rest of the world. It's in the Western Pacific Ocean and you can kind of see in uh, Papua New Guinea and the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, it uh, ranges from about 37 to 45 or 46 degrees south latitude. So it's a lot of latitude difference between here and there. It's almost 80 degrees of latitude uh, on average, which is a pretty substantial thing. So when you do that plane flight, you really cover a lot of uh, territory. And uh, yeah, that's what I tried to show here with that um, great circle route. Uh, a little closer up look at the map of New Zealand that shows a little bit of topography as well as pointing out where some uh, of the bigger uh, human communities are. The city of Auckland is up in the far north on the North Island and uh, cities like Christchurch and Dunedin, which you may have heard of, um, uh, are on the South Island. And you can see that the two islands are very differently shaped and they have different kinds of terrain. And I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit more about that right now. Um, Zealandia as a concept is actually a pretty new one. It's only in the past uh, two or three decades that the idea that there is an eighth continent in the world uh, has really kind of taken hold, at least among some uh, geographers. Uh, new Zealand is uh, uh, as a uh, vision of it being a um, a continent uh, unto itself. It's a largely submerged continent, but uh, this bathymetric image of the Earth kind of shows that, yeah, there's a lot of continental shelf uh, just offshore from New Zealand. And uh, it probably deserves to be thought of as just a very peculiar continent. In fact, the term microcontinent is sometimes bandied about when talking about New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is about 1,000 or 1,500 miles offshore from Australia, so it's pretty remote. And Australia itself is, as you know, pretty remote. Um, oops, I think I need to... Uh, to give you another uh, viewpoint of that uh, bathymetric map and just to get a uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. There's a lot of information in these maps and I don't intend for uh, uh, for any of you to memorize or, or keep in mind all this detail. What I want you to come away with when looking at this, and this is very important when thinking about the birds of New Zealand and just the, uh, the wildlife of New Zealand, is that New Zealand is thought of as, best thought of as being primarily two large islands, this North Island and a South Island that have very different geologic features. The North Island is more of a result of uh, volcanism uh, as a result of subduction between uh, two neighboring uh, tectonic plates, whereas the South Island, in contrast, is more of a, uh, has more of a strike slip uh, uh, earthquake fault that runs, that's called the Alpine Fault that runs uh, the majority of the length of the island, which gives it more of a character similar to California, if you're of geologic inclination. Again, you don't have to remember all that information uh, specifically, uh, but just recognize that the North Island and the South Island have noticeably different characters. Uh, and this ends up being reflected in the bird life and, uh, and in the other natural features and like the mountain ranges 
and the altitudinal variation that results in those islands. Um, let's see here. Troubles. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is a little fun map that I made where I dropped pins on Google Earth uh, showing all the different uh, locations where I did spend some time birding. Uh, this isn't all the locations. These are mostly just the main hot spots or uh, uh, ideas. But uh, you get an idea of uh, just how much ground I covered. When I arrived in New Zealand, I rented a car uh, for the entire 28 days. I've never rented a car personally for such a long period of time, but I rented from a company that allows you to travel across the Cook Strait, which uh, is the uh, narrow strait between the North and the South Islands. It's about a three and a half hour ferry ride. And it's a fascinating experience in, uh, in its own right. But Excuse there... me, Eric. Oh, yes. Stellar presentation so far. Um, the excitements await us. However, there's been a little bit of technical issues with hearing you. Uh, okay. It has been suggested by Courtney in the comments. Thank you, Courtney. Great idea. Um, if you could just turn off your video so uh, it takes less bandwidth and perhaps we'll oh, hear you more clearly. My... Sure. Turn off which thing? Just your video. Okay. So uh, how, oh, like a, in the upper right corner here. Um, so um, like stop video. Okay. Let me do that. There you go. Does Thank you so much. Sorry okay. to interrupt you. Great ideas, team. Sure. No worries. Yeah, no, I'm happy happy for the input because I, I can't tell uh, what you guys are seeing. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is just a, a, a little, a, a playful sort of depiction of just how much uh, ground I covered. And I'll be pointing out not every one of these locations, but a, a handful of them and giving you a little bit more insight into, you know, what what is there and uh, why it was uh, a significant part of my uh, birding experience in uh, New Zealand. Uh, some basic information about, uh, um, oops, did I miss one? No, okay, that's uh, sort of a briefing there. It's a country of about close to 5 million people as of last year. The land area is actually very similar to the land area of Colorado, uh, uh, as you can see from my uh, 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 note there, uh, about 103,000 square miles. Uh, I used that as part of my planning when I decided I wanted to rent a car and drive through. For my work here in Colorado, I uh, work for the uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and I do a lot of field surveying around the state. I've done quite a bit. And I have a sort of an intuitive sense of how much time it takes to drive around Colorado. And I assumed, well, it should be similar driving around New Zealand. As I found out, it's uh, a little bit different as there are not interstates or other main highways crisscrossing New Zealand. Um, it does have 9,000 plus miles of coastline, which uh, is also very different from my uh, usual experience here in Colorado. And uh, that is what gives it, of course, its oceanic and pelagic character. The highest mountain in New Zealand is Mount Cook, also now known uh, to the Maori as Iraqi. And it's about 12,000 feet. So it's not as high as our highest mountains here in Colorado, but it's pretty sizable. And uh, there are many uh, uh, glaciers surrounding the mountain. The capital is Wellington and other major cities include Auckland, Christchurch, Dunedin, and Queenstown. Uh, the currency is the New Zealand dollar, and the conversion is very simple. Um, last year, it was a dollar, uh, one U.S. dollar gets you a dollar sixty in New Zealand currency, and I believe that's about the same. It's been very stable over the years. The main languages are English and Maori, and many of the signs as you drive around the country are in both languages now. Lots of place names are reflected in Maori. And uh, as you'll see, when I'm sharing uh, bird names, I will be including the Maori name for the bird when it when there is one uh, alongside the English name. And uh, this has led to some very interesting naming challenges of some of the birds, especially for us visiting North American birders, as I'll discuss very soon. Uh, some of the islands and chains around New Zealand include Stewart Island, which I'll again, I'll show you very soon. Uh, 
uh, more detail, but there's also places like the Chatham Islands, the Snares Islands, Auckland and Campbell Islands. And these are places where really hardcore birders can sometimes travel to to see breeding colonies of various pelagic species like various albatrosses. The Chatham Islands are a very intriguing place that I did not travel to uh, on this trip. I would love to, but I was not really able to either uh, you know, shoehorn in the time it takes to get there and to come back. It's about 400 miles off the mainland shores of New Zealand, uh, but lots of endemic species on the Chatham Islands, uh, maybe on a future trip. How do you know when you're, once, once you've arrived in New Zealand? Well, when you see this kind of thing in your grocery store, you know uh, uh, you're not in Colorado anymore. Lots of Vegemite and Marmite. I did not sample those myself, but uh, I was kind of recoiled in fear of what they might smell like. Um, New Zealand currency, the $50 bill features the Kokako, which is a fantastic bird that I'll discuss shortly. And um, the signs in the grocery store parking lot that say, please, please return your trundler here, not your grocery cart, your trundler. This is kind of fun. Uh, how did I learn about the birds of New Zealand before I went? Well, I had lots of uh, useful guidebooks, and I just want to list these really briefly. Uh, the Field Guide to the Birds of New Zealand. I have a hard copy um, at home. I don't, well, you can't, I can't really show it to you right now. Uh, I used a, a guidebook on my phone app, uh, as a phone app, the Birds of New Zealand uh, photographic guide, excellent guide, and uh, I'll be making some reference to that later on. Uh, the oceanic birds of the world, so I could finally learn my pelagic species after having known nothing about them for most of those 30 years of my birding life. Uh, I consulted the websites uh, run by the Department of Conservation, uh, which are outstanding uh, descriptions. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so there's that. Uh, also, I uh, listened to re uh, recordings of the birds of New Zealand and uh, some uh, bird songs and calls uh, from those uh, birds of New Zealand online sites. Uh, some basic by the species, uh, uh, species by the numbers. Uh, there's three, only 365 species that have been recorded in the country. Uh, if you've traveled to the American tropics, you know that you go to places like Ecuador or uh, Brazil, and there's well over a thousand species, and it can be a bit overwhelming. And one of the nice things about New Zealand is that it's a very manageable place for those of us living in temperate regions like we do here in Colorado. Uh, it's a lot of species, but it's not as overwhelming as like uh, a, a tropical location. Of those 365 species, a good number of them are not even native and uh, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, a good number are exotics or escapees. A lot of them are naturalized uh, exotics, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those introductions. There's only about 20 species of surviving endemic or native passerines or perching birds. So uh, that's kind of a sad story, but uh, it certainly makes you appreciate the ones that uh, are remaining. There's five species of kiwis, and they're all endemic, only occurring in New Zealand. Say, uh, there are 13 species of penguins that are on the uh, official lists. One is endemic, found only in New Zealand, and there are six regularly occurring ones. And there's 14 albatrosses, 10 of which are regular and breeding. There are some interesting issues regarding bird names. Uh, there's some uh, uh, that uh, can be confusing for us visiting North Americans. Uh, there are two species in particular, the brown creeper and the rock wren. Those are the names that they use in New Zealand, but they are not our species at all. Uh, if you go onto eBird uh, or the Birds of the World Online, you'll see them referred to as, uh, respectively as the PPP and the South Island wren. Um, and then I've got a list of some other names that are, are a little discrepant between what uh, the locals in New Zealand say and what uh, we might refer to them as. Uh, one thing of note are uh, you'll see references if you go to New Zealand as uh, molly mocks are just the smaller uh, types of albatrosses, uh, not to be confused with the larger ones, which uh, again, I'm going to go over that shortly. But uh, yeah, molly mock was a new word for me. Uh, there are other, these are some other names where there's some differences. Uh, shags and cormorants. Uh, 
Uh, if you've traveled to Europe, you might have also come across uh, people referring to shags. That's just another term for cormorant. You can use the terms rather interchangeably, uh, but it can be a little confusing. Um, and uh, there are a few species of robins uh, in New Zealand. These are not thrushes. They are in a whole different family that are unrelated to any thrush that we have or that you might find anywhere else in the world. Uh, place names, uh, New Zealand is now also being referred to as Aotearoa which is the Maori name. And so you might see that on guidebooks that refer to Aotearoa slash New Zealand. Iraqi is Mount Cook. Uh, the city of Picton, which you can take a ferry to from Wellington, uh, is in the process of perhaps having its name officially changed to the original name of the community that lived there called Waitohi, which is a Maori name. And uh, just for fun, I mentioned that uh, Maori names that have are rendered with a WH, uh, that WH is pronounced as an F. So Tawaranui is actually Tafaranui. Uh, Wangari is actually Fangari. And I'm not going to pronounce that last name. I'm going to let you pronounce it in your own head. But just remember that the WH is an F. So let's. Uh, uh, before I go into detail about all the great birds of New Zealand, I'm going to talk first about the other uh, not native, have naturalized perhaps all too well. Uh, most of these birds were brought to New Zealand from Europe, uh, uh, Northern Europe especially, uh, as part of acclimatization societies, which were a really big thing uh, in some of the colonies of England uh, between 1860 and 1880. And uh, these were songbirds, game birds, uh, utilitarian birds uh, uh, that were brought in order to uh, uh, eat pests uh, that were becoming very uh, commonplace with the introduction of all these uh, uh, grain crops in uh, parts of New Zealand uh, that heretofore had not known them. And unfortunately, a lot of these introductions were uh, wildly successful and uh, they remain so to this day. Um, one of the most prominent uh, 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 introductions, uh, and, and for me, it's still a very beautiful one, is the European goldfinch. Uh, the European greenfinch, uh, similarly, uh, these are songbirds that, uh, that you can find at pretty much any spot that you go to when you travel in New Zealand, North Island or South Island. And this was kind of a, a, a bit of a disappointment for me, but uh, it's a reality. Uh, a, a good estimate is that all, a third to a half of the birds that you will encounter uh, when you go birding in random locations will be these introduced uh, songbirds of various types. The red pole, which was recently bumped, uh, as you may know, um, the common and hoary and lesser red poles uh, are now just called red pole. Uh, this, at the time that I took this picture, this was a lesser red pole. Um, still a, a really neat bird to see, but... Um, uh, no longer the uh, life bird that uh, it was when I took this picture. Dunnock is also a fairly common and regular bird found uh, in places. Uh, this bird is a unique bird that, uh, uh, well, it's unique to me in that, uh, you know, I had not seen, this was a life bird for me. And uh, it was, um, it is known for a very interesting uh, mating uh, uh, practice. The uh, Eurasian blackbird uh, is also a very common bird. Uh, in fact, it's probably the bird you're most likely to hear uh, in the spring and in summertime, wherever you go. Uh, uh, to, uh, minus the, uh, the, the native birds that are much harder to hear and you have to go to very uh, special locations, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. Um, but in lots of parks and gardens and yards, uh, it's the Eurasian blackbird uh, that you're likely to hear alongside the song thrush, which is also a very common regular bird. And both the Eurasian blackbird and the song thrush are uh, European, uh, especially British, uh, common songbirds. The Eurasian skylark is also a pretty common uh, uh, singer to be heard. And I did enjoy getting my life bird skylark in New Zealand. Uh, I took this picture as you can see, uh, it is actually uh, doing its skylark thing. And that is a pretty spectacular display. 
Um, again, not uh, unique by any means to New Zealand, but certainly a fixture of the New Zealand countryside. A familiar uh, face uh, to us here in Colorado, bird. And uh, there's actually an introduced owl, the little owl, uh, brought there, I believe from Germany, actually. Um, it was introduced in the late 1800s and uh, isn't terribly common, but uh, it can be found in a number of places in the countrysides uh, in the North and South Island. African collared dove is the main collared dove that uh, was introduced uh, in contrast to our Eurasian collared doves like what we have here, but they fulfill a similar niche. They're not nearly as common as say rock pigeons, but I did not include any pictures of rock pigeons. I didn't think to take any. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, crow-like birds that were introduced. Uh, this is probably the most similar one, the uh, Australian magpie, which is actually not a corvid, but it certainly looks and kind of acts like one. Uh, it is a native to Australia, and it's thought that perhaps produced but certainly it, uh, most of them were brought over from Australia. And uh, brown quail, uh, not terribly common, but uh, they are introduced and they can be found in certain, uh, even in some of the predator free zones that I'm gonna talk about shortly. Um, uh, the brown quail uh, is, a, is a pretty regular feature on the island of Tiri Tiri Matangi, which I uh, will show you some pictures of shortly. And uh, actually even more common than the brown quail is the California quail, which is the surprising uh, bird to come across in New Zealand and be found uh, in parks and gardens and uh, all sorts of uh, locations in the North and South Islands. So I wanted to show a few uh, shots uh, uh, depicting uh, the types of regions where I uh, was able to go birding. This is just a, a, a nice scenic shot of the city of Auckland. I, I think I took this on my first full day in the country. Uh, I went from the airport to places, a uh, place near downtown called Mount Eden. Uh, on the right are just a few kind of, uh, few species that you can typically find in, in some of the urban, parks and uh, open spaces. Uh, the top is the black swan. Uh, black swans do fly themselves uh, regularly from Australia. They uh, have no little, seemingly little trouble uh, covering the Tasman Sea Gulf between Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the middle bird is a masked lapwing, and the bottom bird is uh, definitely an introduced bird, the common chaffinch. Uh, one of the first uh, spectacular uh, uh, protected predator-proofed areas was the Sanctuary Mountain Reserve, which is a little bit uh, south and uh, east of Auckland. It's about 8,500 acres or so. And as you can see from the satellite picture, uh, there's a lot of developed farmland surrounding it, but the mountain property itself is uh, restored forest or a protected forest. Uh, there is a predator proof fence enclosing the entire acreage of that mountain park. And it's pretty spectacular. There's actually three separate enclosures inside that singular enclosure. And uh, what makes, in my mind, Sanctuary Mountain really spectacular is that it is the first mainland reintroduction or translocation site of the Kakapo, which I'll be talking about shortly, which is the uh, critically endangered uh, flightless parrot of New Zealand, uh, a really remarkable species that is in the process of being recovered uh, from near extinction. And I mentioned that as a first, yeah, first mainland translocation site. And uh, it was completely fenced off successfully around 2006. And uh, I was able to visit this place on uh, two different occasions. And I really enjoyed my stay there. Uh, they have a few rather limited, but still very spectacular uh, trails that go through the enclosure. And uh, that's what I try to depict in these photos here. Uh, 
this is a view of the fence, uh, uh, the Sanctuary Mountain uh, Preserve site. And on the right is a photo that shows the biosecurity entrance gate uh, for you to enter. Uh, is a very strict protocol for how you actually go into and out of the reserve. And you go through a, a, a gated system that is electronically monitored so that you cannot open both, you know, two gates to go, you know, that enter into a lobby at the same time. So uh, that way it limits the possibility of predators uh, entering uh, uh, the reserve. Now, this is a different nature reserve, but they utilize the same principle. This is a, a place called the Tafara Nui Regional Park. Uh, this is north of Auckland, and you can actually drive into this one. And this is me about to drive into the gate, and I don't know if you can see that sign it, that tells visitors, it says, rare New Zealand birds live here. No dogs, no cats, no pets. Nothing like that is allowed inside. And, uh, and that's a very strictly observed and enforced rule. And uh, it's really nice to see. This is a really nice urban park. Uh, and uh, I'll have some pictures of birds that I was able to see uh, and enjoy uh, at this Tafari uh, Reserve uh, shortly. On the right, you can see a few uh, such images that I took at the reserve, including the Tui, the J Greg Jerigany, and uh, some silver goals. Whoops. Uh, one of the most spectacular places I was able to visit uh, within a couple days of my arrival, and this is something that if you ever travel to New Zealand, you will almost certainly want to visit. It's the Tiritiri Matangi Island, which is just outside of the city of Auckland. There are daily uh, ferry uh, visits. Uh, you can go on a guided tour or you can just uh, go on a walk yourself for several hours uh, to this island. Um, and it's a really wonderful trip. And I try to indicate, uh, you know, first with this wide view of like where the island is with respect to the city. And then here's a somewhat more close up view uh, of, on, from Google Earth that shows you the, the island. It's not terribly large, but this is a vastly restored island. Uh, up till about 1970, this was a heavily farmed and deforested place. Only about 5% of the original forest was remaining on this island, uh, but the owner's lease was up um, around the, the mid 1970s and uh, conservation groups uh, 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 lobbied for the government to reclaim it and uh, to restore it and have it become a predator-proof uh, or a predator-free island so that uh, native and endemic birds that are under serious threat of predation from introduced uh, mammals like stoats, which are weasels, uh, wild dogs, wild cats, uh, possums, uh, could have a place where they could breed and uh, live under the conditions that they did for nearly 70 million years before uh, humans arrived. That's one thing I haven't really mentioned yet. So uh, New Zealand was largely uh, mammal free for uh, many tens of millions of years. Uh, birds pretty much had free run over all the uh, places in New Zealand for that entire time. And they evolved in a way that uh, allowed them to only have to concern themselves with other birds as far as competing for resources and, and such. Uh, when uh, Polynesians uh, and predecessors of the Maori first arrived uh, about 700 years ago, they brought with them, either accidentally or intentionally, uh, Polynesian rats. And later when the Europeans arrived, they of course brought all sorts of other uh, uh, four-legged uh, uh, predators uh, to a place that had not known such animals the entirety of its existence. And this of course uh, levied a tremendous environmental toll onto New Zealand. And over the past four or five decades, New Zealand has really gone to great lengths to try to establish predator-free islands for the restoration of some species as uh, refuges so that they can recover their numbers and to also start establishing these types of places on the mainland islands, uh, like the Sanctuary Mountain that I just showed you. And I'll be showing a couple other examples uh, as we go through of other places that are trying to do very similar things in New Zealand. Uh, this is just a few little uh, 
pictures showing what it's like when you're actually on the island. It's a beautiful place, lots of native plant life uh, and uh, very well maintained and uh, 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 rules enforced uh, trails. There's biosecurity measures when you go to this island, you have to walk through areas to make sure uh, that you're not carrying spores. Uh, you have to have your boots checked when you uh, go into off and or off and on from the islands. You have to do that when you go into and out of New Zealand. In fact, they want to make sure that you're as um, uh, free of contamination uh, when you arrive in New Zealand. In fact, uh, this was just a, a cute uh, a sign explaining uh, some of the uh, plant life that had was still intact at the time of the kind of the reestablishment of Tiri Tiri um, uh, as a um, uh, as a nature reserve. Uh, another place that I uh, went, which was uh, really spectacular, was uh, this place that I have highlighted here uh, or mentioned here in the bottom. This is called the Miranda Hyde. This was a shoreline. Uh, this is about an hour, hour and a half drive south of Auckland, which is up here in the upper left. And I drove down to this place called the Robert Findlay Wildlife Reserve. And this is where I went to see uh, uh, a lot of uh, shorebirds. I brought my spotting scope all the way from North America. Uh, it was a bit of a chore to pack, but it was uh, great fun and very rewarding. And I'm glad I did. Uh, the um, uh, Findlay Reserve uh, just consists of some trails that go out to mudflats and some observing hides. And from there, you get some really uh, great views of migrating shorebirds. Uh, what you see on the right is a huge flock of uh, bar-tailed godwits, and, um, and then there's some red knots there as well. Um, I don't know, uh, I, Taiki, I believe uh, there uh, might there be some questions. Uh, I, if there's a question or two, uh, I don't want to just run too far afield. And uh, Yes, Eric. Um, there are actually two questions. One is about is from Jesse. Um, okay. Reading here, in Sanctuary Mountain, what are examples of predators? They are so strictly fence, double oh, gating right. out. Okay. And so, then your second question uh -huh. um, from Courtney is: Is there a phone app that you can recommend that is specific to or specialized for New Zealand? And Todd answered in the comments: Merlin Explore, as in New Zealand list, so perhaps you can add to that. But the first question from Jesse about the predators. Yeah, so the I, I tried to mention it earlier. I, I went through that pretty quickly. Um, the uh, predators, uh, the main predators throughout much of New Zealand include uh, the stoats. That's probably the most pernicious one. Stoats uh, are the old world uh, weasels. Um, so kind of anything like what we would have here in Colorado, like the long-tailed weasels and uh, and things like that. Uh, those are really pernicious predators because they go after, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of land birds in New Zealand are, are ground dwelling birds. And, uh, and so their nest sites uh, are just ravaged by stoats. Uh, possums uh, 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 are, are also a major problem of predation. Uh, dogs and cats are, are obviously, you know, a lot of people have dogs and cats, and those, of course, run roughshod all over uh, the islands. Um, mice, mice and rats, uh, even even small mice and rats can really cause major problems for uh, uh, ground dwelling, ground nesting birds. Uh, this is a big problem on the offshore islands. In fact, uh, a number of places throughout the South Pacific, as I'll show uh, shortly where there are nesting albatrosses, the mice have, have done terrible things, even to albatrosses, actual the birds themselves. They uh, will bite and uh, bleed out uh, albatrosses. Uh, and so this is a, a, a definite uh, long-standing issue. And the uh, solutions, and I don't really go into this in my presentation here, but uh, uh, poisoning is a big pursuit. And uh, I found lots of, or I saw lots of poison traps, uh, e even in places like uh, the, the Sanctuary Mountain, but there you also see those on Tiri Tiri and uh, they're on Olva Island uh, down in the Rakiura National Park where I will talk about shortly. 
So uh, yeah, that's a big thing. Um, the is uh, the app that I actually use the most. There's a Birds of New Zealand uh, app that is uh, the app version of their uh, uh, of the actually printed book by Schofield and Stevenson. Uh, that's an outstanding guide, and um, I, I will actually have an extract of of some of the content from that guide a bit later in the presentation. So. Uh, another place that I went, which was really great, uh, was uh, an ad recommended to me uh, by a fellow Coloradan, actually, uh, was this Zealandia Timari Atane Wildlife Reserve. And this is the area that uh, uh, where the initial predator-proof fence was designed and tested. Uh, all around uh, this area here, uh, where all this residential area is, uh, this used to be just a watershed for this uh, reservoir that fed uh, the city or that uh, was used by the city of Wellington. But now they have a predator-proof fence all around this reserve. And this is uh, like an urban park that is a fantastic place for uh, uh, reintroduced, or, or I shouldn't say reintroduced, I should say translocated uh, native birds, uh, especially. And tuatara, for that matter. The tuatara, I don't really talk about in this presentation, but that is the uh, native reptile um, of New Zealand. But uh, yeah, Zealandia was a spectacular place, and uh, certainly anybody who travels to New Zealand uh, needs to visit this place just to see how they do what they do and how influential the work that was done initially at this place has now spread all throughout the islands as far as how they develop the fence, why it's effective, and what a great way of learning about the native uh, flora and fauna of New Zealand is. Uh, I also made a trip uh, toward the end uh, of my uh, New Zealand travels to the Stewart Island, which is on the very far south end of the South Island. So this is the South Island up here. And then you take a like a 45-minute long ferry from the town of Bluff to uh, this town of the small town of Oban on uh, Stewart Island. And this is probably uh, the largest tract of remaining mostly untrammeled native forest that uh, remains in uh, New Zealand, a really spectacular place. I, when I was there, I stayed three nights at this South Sea Hotel in Oban. There's me looking quite happy uh, by my hotel room. Uh, one of the cute things when you travel throughout New Zealand and you see a lot of this in many places, but especially on, this, uh, on Stewart Island are the Kiwi Crossing signs. Uh, from the observation tower at Stewart Island, you can look out and you can see uh, Ulva Island, which is a predator-proofed place that you can take a water taxi out to and spend a few hours walking along the trails there. It's about a 10 or 15 minute water taxi ride, and it's a really remarkable place uh, uh, and definite staple of anybody's visit to Stewart Island. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly here about extinct birds so that we have a, an appreciation of what has already been lost. And these are all just species. Uh, well, they're not all species that were lost in the 20th century, but uh, many of them are, uh, especially the ones that I have pictured here. Uh, the extinctions began with the arrival of the Maori 700 years ago when they uh, brought with them Polynesian rats and, of course, uh, with hunting. And these extinctions greatly accelerated with the arrival of Europeans and certainly put tremendous pressure on whatever native uh, fauna there was uh, over the next three centuries. Uh, one of the uh, birds that uh, is, is uh, bemoaned, uh, and, uh, or two of the birds that have been uh, uh, bemoaned for their loss over the past several centuries are the Hoss's eagle, which was the one of the largest uh, eagles, uh, I believe, in the world uh, living at the time. This was several centuries ago, and the moa, which uh, were probably rendered extinct within 100 years of the arrival of the Maori. Uh, the moa are uh, part of this lineage of uh, the ratites, or uh, paleognathy, which have relations to other uh, flightless birds around the world, including the cassowaries, the emus, and the ostriches that are shown up here at the top. Uh, the moa, um, their actual closest relatives are living birds uh, and flying birds in, in the Americas, called the tinamous. Uh, and what this 
what we learned from the MOA is that uh, there were probably several occasions in, over the past several tens of millions of years where flightlessness uh, evolved. Uh, so it wasn't that flightless birds turned into ostriches and rheas and uh, MOA, but rather it evolved separately along these various lineages for various reasons. Uh, this is a, a, uh, a, a restored skeleton of, uh, of moa. I believe this is in the London Museum. But uh, a North Island moa, which was probably one of the largest of the nine or ten known species of moa, uh, at, uh, when it stood at its tallest, it was about three and a half meters high, which is about 12 feet. That's an enormous bird. Uh, and unfortunately, they are all gone. Uh, the P.O.P.O. P.O. is a was said to have been a tremendous uh, song, uh, songster, of, uh, especially of the uh, North and the South Islands, and uh, both forms of the P.O.P.O. P.O. are extinct. They both died out probably in the early 19-teens. The laughing owl was a native owl uh, and was probably, I believe, was last seen around 1915 as well. The huia, uh, became extinct also uh, sometime in the early 20th century as well. Um, this is the female. The male looked very similar, except it had a much straighter and shorter bill, but a certainly spectacular singer and, and now has also been lost to time. The Stevens Island wren uh, used to live only on one island in the Marlborough Sound region, uh, namely Stevens Island, uh, and was made extinct most likely due to because of uh, introduced mice and rats. But with that said, uh, I wanted to just go over quickly uh, some of the great uh, birds of various kinds that I encountered in New Zealand. Uh, these are uh, endemics. Uh, some of them are just native birds, birds that do breed in New Zealand, but uh, are also found in places like Australia or other nearby islands. Uh, several of these species are either endangered or critically endangered as well. And I'll try to point those out. The New Zealand storm petrel was a big highlight for me. This is a bird that was thought to have been extinct for over a hundred years, but was rediscovered in 2003, uh, actually by someone who I got to meet when I was in New Zealand, when I did a pelagic boat tour. Uh, uh, Brent Stevenson was on the boat that uh, rediscovered this species after uh, only having been known from three preserved specimens last collected in 1895. Uh, he saw these birds uh, flying around and photographed them initially, and then later they collected uh, a few and uh, geotagged them and uh, released them and found out where they breed. So a really remarkable story. It was very exciting to actually see this bird that was thought to have been lost for such a long time. Uh, the next few birds I'm going to show all have the name New Zealand in their uh, bird name. This is another view of the storm petrel, so you can see what distinguishes it, which is its uh, white belly with black streaking. Here's a shot of the New Zealand grebe. Uh, this is also a, a, an endemic uh, grebe uh, uh, for the country. Uh, there are uh, about four grebe species that uh, do occur and are rather distinct to the uh, Australasian region, or three of them are, and you'll see one that is more global. Um, the New Zealand king shag, this is perhaps the rarest uh, cormorant type species in the world. Uh, there's only about 500 or so individuals uh, known, but the population has been stable for a couple centuries. Uh, they happen to live and uh, breed in areas that are uh, not visited by humans very often. They're on these rocky outcrops in the Marlborough Sound area. Uh, but you're able to get close on some of the boat tours that go through the sound, which is what I did when I got these shots of the New Zealand king shag, a really spectacular cormorant. The New Zealand kaka. Uh, the kaka are, is one of three species of native uh, New Zealand parrot uh, in the, of a family called the New Zealand parrots, uh, the other being the kia and the kakapo, which I will talk about shortly. Uh, the kaka has had a resurgence of short uh, uh, of sorts in the in the past century, and that's been very encouraging. It's actually been doing quite well in the Wellington area, in fact. The New Zealand pigeon is the only remaining uh, extant native 
columbid or, or pigeon or dove. Uh, all other pigeons or doves in New Zealand, uh, in the mainland anyway, are um, introduced birds like the collared doves. The New Zealand pigeon is large and it's spectacular and it's fun to watch when it does its display flights uh, and easily seen in many urban areas as well. The New Zealand scop, uh, a native uh, or endemic uh, scop duck species, uh, really uh, very pretty and handsome and thankfully common. The New Zealand fern bird is a uh, type of grass bird, which we don't have in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's a very skulky bird of the marshes and wetlands. Uh, has a very funny short song, kind of like a Henslow sparrow, kind of a hiccup, uh, but very distinctive and very attractive. Uh, and, and it was quite rewarding to search one out and find one uh, on my travels. The New Zealand fantail is also a really uh, enjoyable, pleasant uh, songbird, thankfully quite common. Uh, and uh, although my picture doesn't show it, it does fan its tail out when it's doing its displays and courtships and, uh, and, and just seemingly when it's uh, foraging as well, kind of like a red start. The New Zealand bellbird, uh, a native uh, endemic species uh, of a uh, songbird that is not related to the tropics, uh, but it is a beautiful songbird, which is one of the reasons why it goes by that name. Uh, its song, in my view, is much more bell-like. Uh, it has some uh, very sweet whistles and, uh, and often sings in chorus. Uh, thankfully, a very common native bird that is actually doing quite well, even around human habitation, is the tui. And to, the tui might be thought of as sort of the end uh, emblematic bird of uh, New Zealand, uh, aside from the kiwi. Uh, the tui, of course, is much more common than the kiwi uh, and is found in uh, urban areas and parks and gardens and yards all over the country. Uh, they love to feed on the flowering trees, and uh, uh, they are uh, also very proficient songsters and, uh, and pretty large. It's about, uh, it's not quite as large as a crow, but only a bit smaller but uh, definitely a very attractive bird. Uh, that little white tuft of feathers uh, uh, led to the bird at early on being called by New Zealand, uh, European New Zealanders as a pastor bird because it kind of rem uh, resembles a, a pastor's, like a church pastor's uh, uh, collar. Uh, an extremely rare, critically endangered songbird of New Zealand is the stitch bird. Uh, you will probably never see a photo of a stitch bird uh, that does not have uh, uh, rings on its legs because uh, the population is that closely monitored. Uh, you can, however, find stitch birds within those predator-free uh, areas like uh, in Zealandia or uh, at that Tiri Tiri Matangi Reserve, and that's where I got uh, these photos. The birds are very cooperative. Uh, they just uh, cannot handle living in places where there are mice and stoats and uh, cats. Uh, another uh, really lovely and very petite uh, native songbird is the tomtit. Uh, the North Island robin is a close relative and as well as the South Island robin. And, uh, and these are again, uh, not related to our thrushes. Uh, they're probably more closely related to the old world flycatchers, um, of which the European robin uh, is an example. Uh, and that's one reason why these birds were uh, uh, named robins by the European settlers, uh, because they did resemble the European robin. Like the European robin, the, the robin, uh, North and South Island robins are very confiding and will come very close on approach. And I actually have some video, which I don't have in the presentation, that show them uh, coming very close uh, uh, in encounters. The North Island Saddleback is also a really spectacular songbird of the um, uh, yeah, in those predator-free areas. Uh, these are birds that have to be protected from uh, uh, all the introduced uh, land predators uh, by the Europeans and the Maori. And the South Island Saddleback uh, uh, is the South Island counterpart um, uh, they used to be thought of as the same species as the North Island. 
but uh, they have been uh, split because of slight differences in their song and the size of the little wattles on the cheek. Uh, the North Island Kokako uh, also I encountered only uh, uh, by sound when I visited Tiri Tiri the one day I was able to make it there. The weather was not very cooperative. It was very drizzly and rainy and uh, I was not able to see the Kokakos even in the uh, canopy right over my head, but I did record them singing. Um, I do indicate in my presentation any photos that I did not take, and this is one of those. Um, uh, I was able to see the uh, also very critically endangered South Island Takahe. The Takahe was thought to also to be extinct up until the late 1940s when it was rediscovered in very small numbers in a small batch of tussock grass in the South Island, uh, in a high elevation location where no one thought there would could ever be Takahe. The Takahe is a type of swamp hen, which is kind of like a gallinule or a coot. It's in that same family. It's very large and it is flightless, but it was surviving in this very remote mountain valley. Uh, they have since managed to translocate a number of them to predator-free areas and their populations are rebounding and they're doing quite well. Uh, in those areas. A very similar looking bird, but, uh, but not um, flightless is the Australasian swamp hen. Uh, it's much more uh, faster when it ambles around. And like I said, it can actually fly. It's a lot slimmer and uh, uh, more sleek than the uh, Takahe. A native parrot uh, is the Kia, and this is a very famous bird. If you, you may have heard of this bird uh, uh, in passing from time to time, uh, it's a bird that uh, uh, is very commonly found in um, on the South Island in uh, human areas as they uh, are very approachable, they're very friendly and very curious and also very destructive. So uh, tourists are always cautioned to not let Kia run roughshod over their cars and pull away all the window linings uh, because they uh, that's what they do. They're very curious and they like to tear things apart. The kakapo is a very famous bird and I mentioned this earlier. Uh, this was a bird that was down to a population of only 17 individuals back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, they were translocated to predator-free islands offshore, and now their population is in the low 200s. They are doing well, but the population is still too low for them to be uh, viewable by the general public. Um, there, I was not able to actually go visit any kakapo sites myself that only uh, can be done by uh, conservation Department of Conservation personnel on New Zealand. But perhaps if the population gets to be above four or 500 sometime in the next couple decades, it may be possible to go see kakapo uh, in certain habitats uh, in New Zealand. Uh, there are other native uh, parrots and parakeets. Uh, the red-crowned parakeet and the yellow-crowned parakeet are good examples of that. Uh, a very cute uh, native songbird called the rifleman. This is a female rifleman, um, riflewoman, I might say. Uh, this is the only shot I was ever able to get of this species. Uh, one snap, and thankfully it came out, but uh, I had to lighten it up quite a bit just so you could see its features. It's, it's as small as it looks in this photo. It's a very petite bird, uh, but really spectacular. Um, uh, it's a what they call a New Zealand wren, which is considered to be the oldest lineage of passerine birds in the world. Um, these were probably the, the lineage that is ancestral to all other songbirds everywhere else in the world. Uh, really remarkable story. Uh, somewhat related are the uh, Mahuade, and there are three members that are also endemic to New Zealand, the whitehead, the yellowhead, and the PPP. And this is the bird that I referred to earlier as the brown creeper also. This is what the uh, New Zealanders call brown creeper. And that, that mention I made of the app, uh, of the Birds of New Zealand app, has an interesting story about the name of this bird. And I just wanted to mention this really briefly here. This is from the Birds of New Zealand uh, description for the what they call the brown creeper. And they have a little explanation of the etymology of the various names. And uh, there's some rather pointed criticism of what we Americans uh, have tried to impose upon them as far as what to name the bird. 
we want to call it the PPP, but uh, they are very resistant, and they uh, have, uh, and uh, Brent Stevenson, among others, are, are saying that the North Americans, we can change the name of our bird instead. And he does have kind of a point, I have to admit, uh, because our brown creeper isn't truly a creeper. It's a tree creeper. But um, anyway, I just thought that was kind of funny, and it kind of made me a bit self-conscious when I was traveling there as an American, as a Yank. Uh, a couple other songbirds, which are uh, not actually introduced, but uh, they have self-introduced. Uh, one is the silver eye as a bird that's common in Australia and now is pretty common in uh, New Zealand as well. It's a, one of the white eyes where uh, a family of songbirds that have a very pronounced circular uh, or uh, eye ring orbital. And uh, the only real swallow of any kind uh, that occurs with regularity in New Zealand is the welcome swallow, a wonderful name of a bird that probably to your eyes looks very much like a barn swallow. It's in the same genus uh, and is uh, actually, yeah, is a fairly close relative of the barn swallow. It does have the same type of forked tail and the color pattern is quite reminiscent. A few ducks of note, like the paradise shell duck, uh, this is a male and female, the male molecular whitehead. Uh, um, the blue duck is a, a, a native duck of uh, braided rivers and mountain streams, kind of like the same habitats that you might excellent, but where they don't have dippers, they do have uh, blue ducks. And uh, it's a large, spectacular duck. And I don't know if you can see this, it has a very peculiar well, it's not really a wattle, but a strange shape at the end of the bill. And I imagine it uses this uh, as it's foraging in these mountain streams for uh, various uh, aquatic invertebrates. Uh, another native duck is a type of teal called the brown teal. And I got this very nice photo of this uh, mated pair on a, uh, on a pond at the Tafara Nui Regional Reserve that I showed earlier. The red-breasted dotterel is a, uh, an endemic uh, uh, plover to New Zealand, and I really just like the composition of this shot that really shows both uh, a male and female um, with a characteristic red breast. They have a couple oyster catcher species. I have a photo of one of them here. This is the variable oyster catcher, very similar to our black oyster catcher that's found along the Pacific coast of North America. Uh, they have a pied stilt, which is a pretty common Australasian variety. It's common in Australia and in New Zealand, uh, very similar to our black-necked stilt, just has a more white head. That's a, uh, a parent. I don't know if that's male or female, but you can see the little chick uh, hiding underneath. A really rare stilt, however, is the black stilt, and this is a, a critically endangered species with only about 150 to 200 individuals surviving in the world. And they only live in uh, the uh, upper basins uh, in the region of Canterbury in New Zealand, which is at the kind of the base of the mountains of the of where you might find uh, Mount Cook and uh, the other high alpine mountains of the South Island. Uh, this is a bird that got ravaged greatly by introduced land predators and uh, breeds now where it does just because those are areas where those land predators are far less common. Uh, it's not a hard bird to find, uh, but it's just in very localized spots and just a handful of them. So you have to know where to look to see a black stilt. But uh, it's a very special bird when you come across it. A uh, hoary-headed grebe is a, an occasional visitor. I do not think they breed in New Zealand, but they do fly over from Australia, where they're much more common. The Australasian grebe, similarly, also I may breed in small numbers. I think I uh, actually, they breed probably at the lake where I photographed this, but uh, they also just fly over from uh, Australia largely. The great crested grebe is, uh, has a more global distribution. Um, uh, it is a large and spectacular and very regular bird of New Zealand as well. There are migratory cuckoos that come to New Zealand. I heard them very frequently, but I didn't see them very much at all. And I didn't get a photo myself, which is why I uh, uh, borrowed a photo off of um, the Creative Commons license in, on Flickr from uh, some fellow named Leo. There is uh, one remaining native owl to New Zealand, the moorpork. 
And uh, I did, again, didn't photograph it, but I did get to hear it. And I have some sound recordings that I obtained. I did actually see it on one or two occasions, but uh, not photo opportunities. I saw it at night very briefly in rather dark conditions. It's a cute owl, very much the size of like a pygmy owl. And uh, it's uh, the reason it has that peculiar name is uh, that's a sort of a, um, a onomatopoetic name because it's, it says, uh, boo, boo. this is like more pork or ruru, which is the Maori name. Rails, I thought, would be really tough to see, but they turned out to be surprisingly easy. Uh, I got many good photos of a buff banded rail at the Tafaranui Reserve and uh, the very common flightless rail of New Zealand called the Weka. Uh, I was able to photograph very close up on Blue Mine Island on a, on a, a, a half day trip. The most common heron that one is likely to find is the white-faced heron, very uh, not quite like our great blue heron here, probably more similar to a, a little blue heron. Uh, it's in the same genus as that and like the snowy egrets. They have spoonbills called the royal spoonbills, very large and really spectacular spoonbills that also uh, self-introduced from Australia. There are three species of tern that are very regular, the endemic black-fronted tern, uh, the more uh, widely distributed white-fronted tern, and uh, I came across an Antarctic tern, which is uh, very similar to the Arctic tern uh, in appearance, has some slight plumage differences, and it also is not anywhere near the migrant that the Arctic tern is, which you may know uh, travels globally long distances and um, every year, whereas the Antarctic tern pretty much stays in the sub-Antarctic region and reaching just barely into uh, the south reaches of New Zealand. Other cormorants besides that New Zealand king shag that I mentioned uh, include this pied cormorant, the little pied cormorant, just a smaller version with a more white face of a cormorant. There's the little black cormorant, which is a really spectacular uh, bird with a special dark fringing to its uh, wing feathers and uh, speckling on the face and uh, really beautiful fringes on, uh, on these uh, sort of uh, cheek feathers. And there's also the spotted shag. And I selected this photo so that you can see the spots that actually give the bird its, its uh, name. Pelagic trips were great fun, and I'm going to power through some of these pelagic uh, photos. Uh, I went on four excursions. Uh, thankfully, I don't get seasick. Uh, I feel badly for people who do, because uh, it is such fun to go to places way out at sea and see seabirds that uh, otherwise are impossible to encounter uh, otherwise. Uh, two of my excursions were uh, from the North Island. One was from the South Island. Uh, and one was from way far south uh, of, of Stewart Island. And that makes a difference because uh, the, 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 the ranges of regularly roaming pelagic birds does depend on latitude. Um, you're more likely to see some of those sub-Antarctic type uh, pelagic birds if uh, on an excursion leaving from Stewart Island. I did also make a visit to the Royal Albatross Center, and I'll show some pictures of that very briefly. And I did also uh, two three and a half hour ferry crossings uh, between the North and South Islands. Just to get an idea of what it's like when you're on the boat, I just wanted to show this really quickly. Uh, the below left photo is what it looks like when they're chumming, which uh, 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 one of the boat guides is just chopping up a bunch of fish and throwing it out. And uh, you can see a number of uh, shearwaters and petrels uh, just waiting in the wings for uh, the food to be thrown out. And this helps attract seabirds coming in from miles around. They can smell the fish oil. They can smell the just the chopped fish from great distances. Uh, seabirds have a tremendous sense of smell. Among those seabirds include the fluttering shearwater, Buller's shearwater, the flesh-footed shearwater, and the sooty shearwater. Very kind of similar looking birds to each other, but have distinct differences in their bill color uh, and uh, flight patterns and, and like their wing gait, as they say. The brown skua is a uh, relative of the Jaegers, uh, a, like parasitic 
uh, long-tailed and Pomeranian Jaegers like what we have. The brown skua, uh, you know, these are birds that parasitize uh, and try to uh, steal food from uh, neighboring uh, seabirds. Uh, also, that's something that the northern giant petrel does. Uh, there's a northern and a southern giant petrel. Uh, I just have a photo here of the northern. Uh, these are very large, pretty aggressive birds. They're similar in size to albatrosses. Um, not quite as large, but close. Uh, and they do intimidate non-albatross seabirds at these chumming sites. Uh, petrels include the uh, really lovely Cook's petrel, the Pintado petrel, which I have a couple photos of. You can see the beautiful wing patterns uh, on the Pintado petrel. I was very excited to see this. I only saw it on one of the four excursions I went on, uh, and I was quite thrilled to see those white wing patches. Parkinson's petrel uh, is a close relative of, uh, of the bird that follows here, the Westland petrel. And these are similar to some of those sheer waters, except slightly larger and are just a richer chocolate color, really lovely in flight and very distinctive, actually. One of the delightful things about pelagic birding is it seems so intimidating. Hang of it, you get a feel for uh, the differences between these different types of seabirds. It just takes practice, takes time, and you just watch them all day. And that's the nice thing you can do from a boat. Here's that Westland petrel, very similar to the Parkinson's petrel, except it has a all black on the top of the bill. And that's a distinctive feature of the Westland petrel. There is a gannet called the Australasian gannet. Looks very similar. You might've seen Northern gannets here in North America. Looks virtually identical, except the tail is different. Uh, the Northern gannet has an all white tail, but the Australasian gannet has a black center to the tail, and that is a distinctive difference. But otherwise, it behaves very similarly to our northern gannet. Uh, here's a seagoing tern called the gray knotty. Uh, they had just started to arrive on one of my pelagic trips on one of these offshore rocky islets. Common diving petrel, a small bird, kind of like a myrrh, like the common myrrh that you would get offshore in the, of the western North America waters. And some storm petrels, like the white faced storm petrel and Wilson's storm petrel, similar to that New Zealand storm petrel, except the belly here is all black. And here's a gray backed storm petrel. These are birds that sometimes have been called Jesus birds because they walk on water. They don't actually walk on water, but it sure looks like they do. Uh, that's a very distinctive aspect of their flight style and their or foraging style. And now for the albatrosses. 20 species are known globally. Uh, 14 of them have been documented in New Zealand and 10 are regular or likely to be found on any uh, types of uh, pelagic trips you might go on. And three or four of them are breed only on New Zealand islands or territories. Uh, there, I just wanted to show this really briefly. About 15 or 20 years ago, the, uh, these were three different species uh, that you might find in various literature, the wandering, royal, and shy albatross. In the years since then, these have been split up into nine different species now, and it gets very complicated, and this complicated my learning process, but I think I got a bit caught up on my albatrosses as a result. And it just takes, again, some practice uh, and photography of just trying to see what these birds are like and where you find them. Um, I went to the Otago Peninsula to visit, uh, and that's what's in the background here across this Dunedin Harbor. Um, this uh, Otago Peninsula is where the Royal Albatross Center is, and this is me driving, and that's my rental car, by the way, uh, on my way to the Albatross Center. Um, and I love seeing a sign that tells you, Albatross, 12 kilometers, penguins, 10 kilometers. Uh, I mean, how are we gonna bird or not be excited by that? Whoops. Uh, here's the Royal Albatross Center, uh, the whole structure uh, uh, where they do, um, uh, they, they lead uh, specialized tours. I paid for just a basic tour, but you can also get a special tour that takes you out more to where the nest sites are. Um, but it gets pretty expensive, as well it should be, because uh, these are amazing birds. This is, center is located on this place called Tyroa Head, which is be famous because this is the only what they call mainland breeding site of any albatross species anywhere in the world. 
uh, every, all other albatrosses breed only on like uninhabited offshore islands uh, anywhere else uh, in locations in the world, but they do breed in areas near human habitation uh, here in the Otago Peninsula of New Zealand. Uh, this is a view from the Seabird Lookout uh, near the visitor center. And uh, uh, I encourage you to check out the uh, Royal Albatross Cam. I've got a link here in the, uh, uh, on the page. That's, uh, and if you just do a basic search, you can find out uh, how you can view the Albatross Cam. I actually got to watch those uh, this past uh, summer and fall. Um, and uh, it was really fun and enchanting to keep track of these little uh, albatross chicks as they get big. And they get really big and they do uh, have an amazing story. Other albatrosses of note are the white-capped uh, albatross, the northern royal albatross. This is the bird that breeds at that royal albatross center. And this is a great shot that shows you just how large they are. This is a silver gull uh, kind of chasing this uh, northern royal albatross. And they're right next to each other, but you get a sense of just how enormous this wingspan is. This is at least a three meter wingspan, which is about 11 feet. Uh, truly a, an enormous bird. The Southern Royal Albatross uh, is, uh, was recently split off uh, like 10 or 15 years ago. Very similar uh, in many respects, except it has a lot more white on the wings. Here's a Black-Browed Albatross, a really spectacular bird. I only got to see one on any of my trips, but uh, it's distinctive in that, I don't know if you can see this, this Campbell version, this subspecies has a honey-colored eye which is unique among albatrosses. Here's the uh, former wandering albatross, the Antipodian albatross, similar to the Southern Royal, except it has uh, piano key feathers on the tail, meaning little black uh, uh, inset uh, markings on otherwise white tail. Here's another view of the Antipodian albatross. Here's a close-up of a Salvin's albatross, similar to the white-capped, except an all-gray head, but still a very kind of a dull gray marking on the bill, except for this little uh, uh, mandible uh, uh, orange mark. And this is a nice shot that shows uh, relative sizes of northern giant petrel, the Salvin's albatross, and a wandering, or rather the Antipodian albatross. And you can see even a Salvin's albatross is almost small compared to the gigantic uh, Antipodian albatross, which has is probably the largest albatross species in the world. Penguins were also really special. Uh, 13 species can be found in New Zealand. Six are regularly seen by birders, and three are kind of more easily found, you know, with just uh, rather minimal effort, which is pretty much all I had time for. A uh, few places have viewable breeding colonies that have shows of them as sorts where you get to watch them arrive on shore in the late afternoon or early evening. Uh, when you buy a ticket to these, you get to sit in a, uh, it's like a little amphitheater and the audience is very controlled. You're not allowed to speak. You're not even allowed to move when the penguins are coming ashore because you don't want to disturb them from their habits. Uh, this uh, shows you kind of a layout of where this Umaro and inland. This is on the South Island. You can actually see Mount Cook way up here in the far right corner. Um, as you go zoom in a bit closer, uh, this is the parking area and you walk in and here's where that uh, uh, amphitheater is. And uh, you can either pay to sit in this little cove or in this little area and you can watch the, the penguins when they come ashore after dark into this area. They go through this uh, fence that allows them to pass through to specially designed breeding areas for them, little uh, breeding hovels. Uh, and about two or 300 penguins will come ashore uh, during the night. And it's so much fun to watch them. Uh, you're not allowed to photograph them, which is why I don't have any pictures. Uh, no photography is allowed because they don't want flashes going off or anything like that. But this is what a blue penguin looks like at sea. And I got a photo of one on one of my pelagic trips. Uh, and they are pretty petite and really quite cute. Uh, th this is the Fjordland penguin, which is also a regular penguin, but you have to go down to the far southern end of the South Island to get to an area where uh, you might see them. This is I took uh, from Stewart Island. And um, 
This is the yellow-eyed penguin, which is the endemic penguin of New Zealand. You can only find this species of penguin in New Zealand. Uh, they don't even seem to swim anywhere else in the southern hemisphere waters. Uh, really remarkable. And uh, I was able to find this bird on my own, uh, kind of on a lark. I was, I was kind of hoping for the best. And I, was, I did just because I took this picture through a spotting scope as the bird was making its way back to its nest up this enormous sand slope. And that poor bird, uh, uh, yeah, you can imagine how hard it is for a bird with really short legs to go up a sandy slope, especially a penguin. But uh, that's where they breed and they have their nest and uh, they're successful year over year, apparently. Here's another view of a yellow-eyed penguin. I wanted to point out that the reason the face looks as, as like this is that there's actually very fine yellow feathers all around the face, and but at a distance, it just kind of looks like a yellowish blur. But uh, yeah, the faces really do look like that. And at last, the kiwis. Um, I was able to find my own kiwis. Uh, it took a lot of effort, and I didn't really see them until very late in the trip. And I had to learn a few techniques over how, of how to, to find kiwis. You have to go after, well, you pretty much have to go after dark and you have to go in areas where um, they're uh, very unlikely to be disturbed by um, uh, humans and uh, uh, land predators. And I got my first kiwis uh, when I was um, birding on the on Stewart Island. Um, and I have a little picture of that. Before I was able to search for my kiwis, though, I did pay a quick visit to the National Kiwi Hatchery, uh, which is on the North Island. And this is an area where they are trying to restore the population of the North Island brown kiwi, uh, which has been greatly affected by human habitation. Uh, but thankfully, the uh, North, the people who live on the North Island are really supportive of efforts to bring back kiwis and make them a lot more common than they have been over the past century or two. Uh, and so there is a kiwi hatchery that uh, I was able to visit and do a tour of, and that was great fun. Uh, you also cannot take pictures inside the hatchery of the uh, uh, where they are. Um, uh, raising or uh, rearing the eggs that uh, that they do take from uh, nest sites in the wild. Uh, they raise them in this hatchery so that the young kiwi, which uh, ordinarily are very lightly parented, uh, are not predated upon. Once the kiwi become old enough and reach adult size, they can be returned to the wild. And uh, they have no problem with being habituated to humans, apparently. Uh, I, we were told repeatedly that kiwis are just cantankerous, grouchy, grumpy birds and uh, do not ever take to humans. Uh, or, and, and also, they don't really get parented very much anyway. So they, they, they know what to do once uh, they get returned to the wild. And once they're large enough, their risk of predation drops immensely. So they just need to be raised uh, in such a way that uh, they run no risk of predation until they I took, and this is what, from inside the uh, museum, and, um, and it's a really enchanting place, and I did get to see uh, very recently hatched kiwis, and uh, they have a great program where uh, visitors can uh, pay to name some of the birds, and uh, that's really fun. This is a, a picture I did not take, but I did get to see the North Island brown kiwi. When I, when I Excuse me, Eric. To Fara Nui. Eric. Uh, I got to see and hear them. Oh, Eric. Yes. Uh, yes. Pardon me. Just wanted yes, to. We were having some uh, little sound issues there again, and I just wanted to let you know that we find ourselves at oh, eight thirty, okay. the uh, scheduled end of this presentation, okay, yes, but. If there are okay. questions, would okay. you be okay. able to just stay yes. for like a minute or so just to see yes, if there are absolutely. any recurring questions yeah. to end the night with? Sure. Yeah, I'm just about done. I'm, uh, the Kiwis were my last uh, birds to talk about. So, uh, yes, uh, if I can just go for just another 30 seconds or so, I just want to mention North Island Brown Kiwi, the little spotted Kiwi, which again, this is not my photo. Uh, but I did get to see them at the Zealandia. I did a night tour there. And then this is a photo I did take. This was my southern brown kiwi, which I got to see at night when I, and this is a story that uh, I will have to share on some other occasion, but I got to ride around in a police car 
to help a cop who wanted to help me find Kiwi when I was on Stewart Island, and uh, which is a fantastic story in itself. But anyway, that's my life for Southern Brown Kiwi. Uh, I did miss a number of species uh, on my visits, which is fine. That always happens whenever you go on a big trip. Uh, but uh, still, I considered uh, my birding to be very successful. Uh, I was, there were a number of places I didn't get to visit just because even if you drive 5,000 miles in 28 days, it's still not enough, but that's okay. Uh, uh, things I can go see on another visit. Um, so overall, I spent four weeks in the country, uh, 146 species I got to see or hear. 109 of those were lifers, including all the Kiwis, uh, well, uh, uh, three Kiwis, I should say. Uh, and all the albatrosses were new and all the penguins were new. I snapped over 2,000 photos on those pelagic trips. I got 38 species of birds in my sound recordings and 117 species were photographed. And I even got to see the tuatara, which was the native reptile, the weta, the, the native cricket, mako sharks, dusky dolphins, some amphibians, and I got to visit Hobbiton. So anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. I know that was a very long talk. I know I went really long, but I just wanted to share all my photos and, and uh, experiences or as much as I could and uh, get you excited about the idea that you too can go visit New Zealand. Thank you, Taiki. Thank you, Eric. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Please send your congratulations and thanks and love in the chat. We are seeing it. Really great things. I do want to get us started with our first and perhaps last question of the night. Um, this okay. is from Courtney. Can you tell us a little more about the Kiwi story in the cop car? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was uh, on my first night there. I, I wanted to just find a Kiwi by myself. I was, they have Kiwi tours that you can go on, and I recommend those by all means. But I was being kind of a cheapskate, and I just wanted to see if I could walk around and find my own Kiwis. And I wanted to go check out the airfield uh, on on the on Stewart Island, which you're not supposed to go to. But I thought, well, maybe I can go there. It's nighttime, and as I was walking down the road, there was a cop car came by, probably to make sure people don't go to the airfield because they don't want you doing that. But he knew I was a tourist. And once I mentioned that I was looking for Kiwi, he said, well, why don't you hop in and we'll go, because I see them all the time when I do my rounds. So I got in this car and I and we were, drove around and we only had to be in the car for about five or 10 minutes and we saw Kiwis uh, crossing the road uh, in his headlights. And it was just a funny story because that was not at all anything of what I imagined I would ever do in my life. But yeah. They're, they're very friendly people and uh, they want you to have a good time there. And uh, yeah, that's how I got to see my life for Kiwi was uh, with the help of the police. Excellent. 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 Thank you for that. And the many stories there in, uh, I do not see any other questions other than oh. Eric. I hope you can just take a second to read the chat. There's so many oh, yeah. great and positive words for you, thanking you for the presentation. Uh, you're an, ins you motivated folks. Um, so I just, I just want to make sure that you are seeing the roses that people are throwing on stage for you. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. outstanding. I, work. 